Awards. Please put your hands together for Steve Mack. So, Steve, um, normally, especially when we have a few dog owners around, I'm going to leave some time for you to all ask your nitty gritty questions about what's going on with your dog and see if we can catch Steve out. Um, <laughs> Uh, but let's just talk through a few things first. I mean, tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, love of dogs, clearly. How do you become a dog trainer? How do you get into this? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, very much love of dogs. Um, and a, a love of training, really, and learning. So, um, as a kid, you never had a dog. Never so, had a dog. Never had a dog. Uh, but then there's the good old days with dogs in the street. So, we'd always have a big plane and dogs would be out. I was just properly into the dogs. And the fact that we didn't have one, I think, made it even rarer and more special. Uh, and then a few dog training schools were opened up locally. <laughs> and I would go without a dog, like a freak, um, or borrow a dog, or lick a dog, or whatever. Um, I just really, really got into it. And the more I did, then I started to see maybe cracks where maybe the classes weren't as great as they could have been, and maybe see little signs of stress from the dogs and maybe the owners. Um, and then got to a point where I thought, well, I couldn't do any worse. So, bit the bullet, 20 odd years ago. And um, yeah, still getting away with it now. Wow. What was it that caught your attention with dogs? And why were you, can you explain why you were sort of attracted? Was it the, they're good companions, or they're just sort of cute, or you're just fascinated? Everyone loves dogs. So yeah. me saying, oh, I love dogs, it isn't good enough. That's, you know, that's, that's not the defining criteria. I, I, I love the fact that what would keep me awake when I'm, when I'm watching dog training in our classes is, how come that owner is saying the same thing as that owner? That dog's doing it, and that dog's not. Yeah. So the actual, the learning part, the behaviour part, is what really made me obsessed, and, and, and probably obsessed. I've had a few what my mum would say normal jobs, because <laughs> um, being a dog trainer wasn't a job when I was younger. Um, so I've had a few normal jobs, but I'd be, I'd be, I'd be at a desk, but I'm all I'm thinking about was that dog in right. the class at the weekend, yeah. or last night, to the point where it's just all, all in comes in and, and yeah, just threw my hand in and went all in. And you touched on something there, you know, there weren't many dog trainers around. Have we become more conscious of training dogs in the last sort of generation? You know, are we more interested in behaviour now? Is it more about making dogs fit us? What is it? Yeah, I think so. I think um, <laughs> us having dogs isn't a new thing. No. Um, but I think um, maybe the empathy and maybe even the sympathy uh, with dogs, because we're asking them to come into our world and live by our rules um, so and, and there's there's we're surrounded with more and more media and videos and social media and books and tv shows so i don't think maybe as a parallel i don't think we're more into eating but we're a lot more into cookery shows and yeah, cookery yeah, books yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. that kind of thing so i think it's the same with everything yeah but yeah luckily i've got the wave of dog training and uh, yeah I, I, I sort of know the answer to this, but I wonder anyway, do dogs need to be trained or are we just training them for us? I mean, does a, what does a dog get out of it? Symbiotic, you know? I think um, if, if, if they can slot into the niche that we provide for them, their life is going to be much less stressful. My life is going to be much less stressful. So, um, you know, get that out of jobs to do. Uh, and, yeah, I think both parties, let's say it's symbiotic, both parties are going to have a better life and complement each other's lives. You know, a lot... I think when I was first started going to dog training classes and observing dog training, it was very much, I'd, even as a kid, I'd hear the dog trainer say, oh, I wouldn't let him get away with that. <laughs> That's nuts. You know, the whole ethos seemed to be you versus the dog. Mm. And it should be you with the dog. You know, the mm. first rule is have a dog that wants to hang out with you. And, and, and so that gets rid of a lot of punishment, check chains, all of that kind of stuff. You know, I wouldn't want to hang out with someone who's main... Lesson one in dog training classes used to be you have to correct your dog. Yeah. Already the mentality is where you're looking for something wrong that you can correct. Whereas if, if lesson one was how to reinforce your dog, you're immediately looking for the good stuff to action. So you, you know, if you've got the mentality as an owner that you're looking to, to react to the good stuff, you've got a much better pair of glasses on than looking for stuff that you want to correct. Yeah. And I think that's the same with parents and teachers and managers and everything else. But, you know, one species at a time. I'll take the easy one. And so you said that I sort of forgot about choking. I remember, God, as a kid, like people had to, like we had a really, sorry Benji, but stupid gold retriever, you know. Um, mm, no, but Benji. Us, well, probably, yeah, probably us. But having them on that, and yeah. dogs don't learn through that, you just choke himself. 
they learn, but at a cost. Yeah. You know, if, if you touch the cooker when it's orange, you're going to learn, but you might, but you're not going to love hanging out with the cooker, <laughs> you yeah. know? So, but, that, you know, that's how we evolve, and hopefully we can evolve for the good. Yeah. Um, you know, talking about TV stuff, when I was a kid, it was just the back ends of Barbara Wood House. And it was Chihuahuas and Shepherds and Great Danes and everything was sits and all of that kind of stuff. And it had its place, but yeah, we moved on, yeah. some of us. Tell us about your work across the world, because you train in many different countries. Yeah. And I'm, I don't know if it's, we think of ourselves as absolute dog lovers. I don't know if every nation thinks of, of themselves as dog lovers, but we have a special affection. I'm curious how different cultures treat dogs in different yeah, ways in your experience. It's really interesting. I mean, and it's such a treat that I can get to travel because of dog training. Um, the lot, I, I, was in, I was in China last month and we're setting up colleges there for the Institute of Modern Dog Trainers. Um, and it's going to be huge. It's a massive country. They're super aggressive and they're super passionate about bringing dog training to China. They just don't have it. So it's like day one in China, which is like, I, I, I go goose big, please just think about it. Because they're going to accelerate their understanding of dogs. They're going to squeeze in 10 years what we've squeezed in, in the last thousand years. What do you mean they don't have it? Like, because humans would have still lived with dogs. What have they been doing? No, but, but such a small, it's a massive country, but such a small percentage, which is still millions, own dogs. Okay. And they love their dogs, but they don't really know how to love their dogs. And that's a massive broad statement, but that, that's what they tell me. So we're setting up colleges to teach instructors that will then go on to teach owners, and then we will take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in, in Peru, uh, I was in Peru last year, and and those dogs are, are, are fascinating. But when I landed in Peru, um, the taxi driver was saying, "Oh, what do you do?" I made the mistake of telling him. He went on and on and on about dogs, um, and he says, "You'll love Cusco." He says, "As you as you get to Cusco, the dogs, when you get to traffic lights, they wait. They're all straight." He said, "They all wait." until the light goes red, and then across they go. And I'm like, yeah, okay, mate. <laughs> Come down in an aeroplane, not a shower. Um, anyway, we got, we got to Cusco, and, and there they are. And, and it's just like a cartoon. These, these street dogs, their own, but these street dogs of all shapes and sizes, maybe 12, 15 of them. They stood there, the traffic, da, 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 da. the lights change like a cartoon, off they go. And, and that's, that's opera condition, that's you know, learning by consequences, I suppose. Yeah. That's natural selection as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, so, yeah. Um, but the dogs there are, are, are amazing. Their, their life, I think, if I was a dog, I'd want to live there. Um, basically, in the morning, 6 a.m., oh, that's one of them, that's one of them there, that's a typical one. Um, six o'clock in the morning, you see all the front doors open and all the dogs go out and they just hook up with their mates and they just live their life and they just mooch around and they, they're out for 10 hours or whatever and about eight or nine o'clock when the sun's going down, you see them all go back into their doorways, the door opens, they get their bed and breakfast and tomorrow they just rinse and repeat. And they have a wonderful life. And you know, all of my training and, and, and the ethos of the, the IMDT trainers is we want to give the dogs choice as much as possible. But when we've got leads and harnesses and front doors and walls and restrictions, it's hard to see what the dog would really choose to do. But in Peru, I got to see what a domestic dog would choose to do. So that was me, I was out on the street wow. with my cameras, video cameras, just following them like a So is that a truly spot. happy dog then? Is that sort of everything it wants? It's fed and watered, but it gets to go and play all day long. I, I, I think, it's, I think um, it's a dog choosing to do what, what they want to do. Um, and what I didn't see, is I didn't see any dogs chasing birds, I didn't see any dogs barking at other dogs, I didn't see any running, I didn't see any of those plastic tennis ball tracky things being done. I, they, they, they had time, I suppose they had time. Yeah. Um, and that's the difference. We kick the door down, we go running out the front door of our dog because we've got 10 other jobs to do and the world goes past like a conveyor belt with the dog and they're having to grab information and I think that's why sometimes dogs get a little bit hectic and a little bit frantic and they almost have to gorge on their environment because they're back indoors within half an hour. Right. right? And, and, and I think the owners don't feel too much better for those kind of yeah, dogs yeah. either. I think sitting on the grass, chilling out, like these guys are doing with their dogs, that's what I want to do if I'm a dog. Yeah. 
That's what I want to do. That, that's a good dog park. So it makes you think that actually that you don't always ever have a happy human, happy dog. It's sort of a compromise when you're doing it the way we often do it. I, I, I guess, well, why can't you have both? Yeah. Yeah, I think you can have both. Um, I, 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 and, and it is about complementing each other's life. And, and believe me, if you, after you've worked hard today, man, you've got another three days. Good luck. But if, when everyone's gone, you sit on the grass with a dog for 20 minutes. After those 20 minutes, mm. we'll have a happy dog and a happy joke. I was going to ask you about that actually. Um, I think we're appreciating more and more sort of mindfulness and actually dogs give us a bit of an excuse not just for exercise or even to go and speak to people in the street we wouldn't normally speak to but actually just to spend time sitting and doing nothing. A hundred, a hundred percent, a hundred percent and yeah mindfulness, headspace apps is a multi-million pound industry but meditation and um, yeah I remember you know Nancy I've got a little chihuahua, all, all our dogs are rescue dogs but a little chihuahua across Jack Russell across Beelzebub kind of dog. Um, and I'm, I'm, I was sat in the fields last summer and I'm watching her, watching a dandelion thing floating about. And I'm thinking how wonderful that she can spend 10 minutes watching a dandelion. And then I realise I've just spent 10 minutes watching my dog watching a dandelion. It's nice, it's a good deal. You weren't worrying, you're stressing at that point about anything else, yeah. Um, <laughs> How many dogs have you got? I'm just wondering. Like, is there a uh, we do a stock take every Friday. Um, so we have uh, six dogs. Okay. So from the top, we have Pele, who's an ex racing greyhound. We have um, Ash, our uh, German Shepherds. We have Pablo, Staffy, Spider, Whippet, Summer. We've been fostering her for about six years. Um, Lurcher, and Nancy, the Chihuahua. Do you use them to keep learning? I mean, do you sort of, how do you learn when you're developing dog training? So, um, um, so I, I, I'm always learning. I, I, I try and, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, it's like learning a language. You saturate yourself in a country. You can't help but learn if you, you know, allow yourself to, to, to think about things and question things. I'm always questioning. I always want to know why. So I was the annoying kid at school that said, yeah, but why? And, and if I was told a why, yeah. And I got it, yeah, good enough, yeah. I'm all in. But if, when I wasn't told why I should do something or what the benefit is, I wouldn't do it at all. So I was either the best student or the worst student, depending on the teacher. And I think when I'm teaching uh, instructors, when they're teaching owners, what they're teaching, that's e easy. How they want the owners to act, that's easy. It's the why. It's the why where owners go, okay, I can see what the benefit is. And not only the benefit for the dog, but the benefit for the owner. Mm. So, so the why and the benefit is everything. And also, if I pull out any of these dogs and I say sit, guess what question the dog's gonna say? Why? And if it's worth it for the dog, they can see the benefit, all day long they're gonna sit. And if they don't, they won't, and neither would I. How has your training changed when you look back to 20 years or so? How has how your sort of focus of what you do evolved? So, um, so, so really, you know, when I, when I first started hanging around as a dog training groupie, um, it was very much ex-police, maybe ex-military instructors. So it was quite sort of see one, do one, teach one. And it, and it was very mechanical. You put your left hand here, your right foot there, and the dog will do this. And really, in those industries, if the dog didn't do that, they didn't change the training, they changed the dog to fit in with the training, uh, which is ridiculous. Um, so I'm, I'm a lot more I'm a lot more aware of playing the cards in front of me. You know, not no two dogs are the same, um, and just train the dog that's in front of me today now. Uh, and also, I just want to teach the dog how I would want to be taught. So I'm always looking at the world from a dog's perspective uh, because that's what will give me empathy as well. Yeah, um, I've asked a lot of questions. I mean. Give us some sort of general tips. I don't know how you do that, but where do you? I know you want to sort of talk about body language and things, but where would you um, start? I've got a lot of very dogs here, but um, give us some sort of takeaway advice. Um, so I, I think takeaway advice is um, yeah, just be nice to the dog. Really, just be nice to the dog. Be the person, be the person your dog thinks you are. But be the, be be the person that the dog's gonna want to want to hang out with. You know, if 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 your dog wants to hang out with you, you don't have a recall problem. You don't have a grief of him disappearing over the park. 
tearing into other dogs and other people, etc. So um, concentrate first and foremost. How does the dog feel? When, when so I the emotion of the dog. A hundred percent, because everything else is easy after that. So when I first started teaching, all the focus is on what is the dog doing. And it was all focused purely on behaviour, how to get the behaviour, how to get the behaviour. Whereas if the dog doesn't feel safe or secure or confident or trusting or anything else on Maslow's pyramid, um, the behaviour is going to be sketchy, it's going to be on thin ice at best. So you might get it in the village hall, you might get it in the kitchen, but you're not going to get it down the park if the dog doesn't feel safe and secure and know that you've got their back. So really, if the dog does feel good and safe and happy and, and you've built an optimistic dog, a dog that goes, what's in it for me? Yeah, cool, I know you've got a good history of paying out. <laughs> you're laughing. So yeah, concentrate on how the dog feels rather than what the dog does. That could be quite hard for humans to accept though. If, if they've got problems, you're sort of saying actually the dog doesn't trust you. That's a bit of an insult to a dog owner, isn't it? No, 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 no. So dog owners have enough guilt. When I, when I do a lot of home visits, the owners, nine times out of ten, the owners will answer the door and say, I know it's my fault really. <laughs> and, uh, and they've got enough guilt to build their own religion. And, and it's not, it's not, you know, if, if I've turned up on their doorstep, I say to owners, it's my problem now. It's not even your problem, it's my problem now. So, and, and we just deal with it and work it through. But if, if the dog doesn't feel happy, trusting all the rest of it, and the owner can recognise that, we can invest in that. Mm. We can teach a dog to be optimistic. You know, I can give you a tin of hot dogs and a Labrador. In 10 minutes, you'll have an optimistic Labrador. Guaranteed. <laughs> so, you know, it, it can all be done and, and it's, it's no good shying away from it. You've got to say, well, what's the problem? Or how can we make things better? Yeah. And then do something about it. Um, that's, that's it. Fantastic. Um, right, I've asked enough questions. So, dog owners, your chance to be brave and share a few things. We've got a few different roaming mics. Let's start with this gent here, and we get another microphone over there, and then we'll come to you as well. Oh, I, I, I've gone to questions before anyone was expecting it. Sorry about that. Sorry. You're, you're very quick off the mark. Okay, this is good. Um, tell us about the do dead dog test while we're waiting for microphones. The dead, all right, okay, so the dead dog. So, um, yeah, so I do a little bit of a chapter in the book, uh, Easy Peasy, Puppy Squeezy, where, um, I'm talking about the cue or the command, uh, leave. Look at that, look at that. Um, where people teach leave, I see trainers say that they're teaching leave. Um, and, and they don't, they're not. They may think they're teaching it, but, but, but they're not teaching it. Um, it may be that they're asking dogs to sit and they put a bit of food on the floor and they say leave, and then they pick up the food. That's not teaching leave, that's teaching to sit with a distraction. Right. Or they say leave and the dog looks at them and then they reinforce that. That's just reinforcing eye contact, it's not reinforcing leave. Leave is the absence, doesn't, it doesn't cure behaviour. When you, when you say a behaviour, that's a command or a cue. When you give a cue, then you need to see a behaviour that correlates to that cue. And when you see that behaviour, you reinforce it. If you say leave, you're not going to see a behaviour. Right. Nothing new is going to occur there. I say to owners or trainers, what does leave mean? And they say, ah, oh, it means don't. Don't do this. Don't go for that. Don't do this. Mm. Don't. If you say don't in front of anything, that isn't a behaviour. And, and so the dead dog test, or, or in human psychology, the, the dead man test is, if a dead, if a dead man can do it, it's not a behaviour. Right. A dead man can leave for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, very uh, very yeah, start yeah. saying down to a dead man. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone can do that. Right, right sir, so we have a microphone. Go ahead. Hello there. Uh, I've got a family member who's uh, got a rescue dog from India, believe it or not. And from India? Yeah. Cool. It's like a little prairie dog or hunting dog. Yeah. And uh, don't know exactly how old, could be a year to 18 months, I think. Uh, jumps up a lot of people and she's not inclined to get it trained. So, uh, A, is it ever too late to start? And B, um, how do I persuade her to do something about the jumping up there? Or is there a tip? <laughs> yes. Thank you, that's a good question. Um, so, it's never too late. Is, um, well, it's a good news, so it's bad news if the person doesn't want to do the training. Uh, but no, it's never too late. If, if it's physically possible, it, here's the ingredients, I think, for any of us to do any behaviour, any species. If it's physically impossible, 
and we know how to motivate, then we can, and we set a correct criteria, okay? So if it's physically possible, we know how to motivate the animal to do it, and, and the criteria is a sensible level, then absolutely we can teach any behavior whatsoever. Um, so food will always be a primary reinforcer. Uh, none of us would be here without foods, okay? Um, some of us are greedier than others, but food is a reinforcer. There, there's no argument there. So if the dog jumps up, that's a behavior that we don't want. So what we need to heavily reinforce is, is what's called an MEB or a mutually exclusive behavior. A mutually exclusive behavior is, is if the dog is doing a mutually exclusive behavior, they can't do the unwanted behavior at the same time. So a mutually exclusive behavior could just be a sit. I would just teach that dog that when I say sit, that dog sits. Whatever else is happening, and, and we mess about with the 3D, so in any, with any distraction, for any duration, at any distance, when I say sit, the dog sits. So, and then the dog will just learn also as a default, if in doubt, if you think there's something in it for you, put your bum on the floor, and then heavily, heavily reinforce sitting. If the dog's jumping up, fantastic, the dog wants greeting. We know the reinforcement, it's acknowledgement from people. So teach the dog that people say hello when you put your bum on the floor. So much easier when you're up on a couch, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and the example of the one that wouldn't work then is down, because that doesn't pass the dead dog test. Um, it off, would it? Off. The yeah. dog has to jump up before you can say off. Yeah. So you, you could inadvertently build a silly, the dog goes, well, and then you reinforce the dog for getting off. The dog says, okay, well how can I make this monkey say off and feed me? Oh yeah, I jump up, they say off, and then I get food. That's, that's the dog training the human. Yeah. It's like Planet of the Apes, it's all upside down. Uh, who was next? We had a oh, lady here. Yeah, we've got someone else here. Um, hi, I have a pug that likes to bark all the time. Unlucky! At absolutely everything, and actually sometimes at nothing. She'll just stand in the middle of the living room and bark. Yeah. So is there a reason for that? Or can I help do something to help her stop? Because it does get a bit much sometimes with... It's a lot of barking. Okay. Um... And in an ideal world, we'd pull, the, pull on those little individual threads and try and find out what the motivations were, maybe find out what happens after the barking, and maybe not always, that something will always happen, but I feel your pain. Um, you could teach, okay, this dog, your dog holding a little teddy bear or a toy would be a mutually exclusive behaviour. So you could make her into a teeth on potentially teach her to be a retrieving machine. So when you say, go get Teddy, she can't wait to go and pick up Teddy and bring it to her. So if she does that, put the two together. So when she barks, or not only when she does bark, but other times as well, otherwise she'll teach you this, okay, like barking. Um, hide Teddies around the house, I have Teddies around the house, give the cue, when she goes and gets it and brings it to you, super heavily reinforce it, okay? Yeah. Stop. So while she's barking, so, I have to distract her away from If you see that she's going to go into a barking zone, so if something, if, okay, so if something triggers and then she barks in response, okay, and then you go and tell her to retrieve. Something okay. triggers, she barks, you tell her to retrieve, you reinforce her retrieve. Okay. Something triggers, she starts barking, you tell her to retrieve, you heavily reinforce her retrieve. What okay. happens is, you've got A, B, C, D. She'll, A will become the Q for D. So if she'll hear the trigger, it's yeah. going to get to teddy time. Okay. okay, so she'll cut out the middle ground. Also, check that there's, there's everything else. Holistically, we have to have a look as well. So she's getting sufficient uh, mental, not mental stimulation and physical stimulation. All dog trainers say that. I don't think our dogs need more stimulation. I think they need more release. Yeah, a third of the way of that. Yeah. And that will set her off. Yeah, so. so it's not about putting more energy in. It's about giving nice, sensible outlets. But, okay. but retreat, I mean, make, obviously make sure physically and health-wise everything's up yeah, yeah, exactly. That's always fine. standard. Yeah, it's just fine. Um, but also, if there's particular times of day, think what, you know, maybe feeding her with a Kong or stuffed activity toys, that kind of thing, so she's got something else to do instead, rather okay. than twiddle her thumbs in the middle of the living room waiting for birds. Um, but maybe cons <laughs> control, <laughs> we've all been there. Um, control and manage the environment as well, so even just closing the curtains or having the TV on, so those more subtle triggers don't spark okay. her up. Um, but it could be a million things, so the shortcut is to ask and reinforce for something else instead. Yes.
Brilliant, thank you very much. Cool, that'll be 380 pounds. <laughs> yes, thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, we're getting a nine week old puppy, Cocker Spaniel puppy, yeah, cool. in a couple of weeks. We have to travel for just over an hour in the car with yeah. him. Um, so firstly, the best way to do that, whether to have him on our lap or in a box or whatever. Okay. And secondly, um, would you advise crate training and so how to do that? Okay, cool. Thank you. So, um, we'll kill two birds with one stone here. Cocky puppy, cock and puppy, cool. What's it, have you got a name? For, not you, I know you've got a name. Bertie. <laughs> uh, Bertie? Yeah. Cool. Um, so, crate training and travel and, and, and blending the two and that first night away from breeder and all the rest of it um, is, a, is a big deal. It's a big deal for you guys, it's exciting. It's a massive deal for Bertie, because for Bertie it's going to be like going to a new planet with different sights and sounds and smells. So try and blend that as much as possible. What I would do, what I would insist upon, is I would get a crate, but I'd get it round to the breeders now, so, so um, Bertie can become accustomed to the crate, have, have the blanket there now, so the smell of the litter and the present home and Bertie becomes nice and seasoned and familiar and it'll be like a comfort blanket and that will be a safe area. I'll get the owner to do all the feeding in that crate. So that crate has a really, really positive association. Then when you pick Bertie up, not only do you take Bertie, but you take the crate. So you, Bertie can travel safe, because it needs to be secure anyway. You know, you can sit in the back on the back seat with Bertie and all the rest of it. Um, but to Bertie, he's just staying in his familiar crate. He's not going into that now loud, scary metal time machine with people that he doesn't know very well. So it will help um, taper the old into the new. And when you get home, you clear out the sick and the wee, and then you just keep doing that for weeks. <laughs> no, that's your problem, not mine. We've got the rest of you. Sure. <laughs> Let us know Christmas how it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Great. Anyone else? Any more? Yes. Can we just behind there, lady with her hand up? Hi. Hello. Uh, got a rescue collie. Hurrah! Had him for five and a half years. Uh, very mistrustful, very scared to start off with. Yeah. Come a long, long way from that. But now uh, we work with the ball to gain the trust and to get the bond. But now he's got the ball when he's in the park. He, if he, I don't work with the ball anymore to come and keep him a little bit lower. Yeah. But now if he gets a ball, finds a ball in the undergrowth, uh, we'll then go and take it to every other person in the park for them to throw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and will interact with me and, you know, sometimes I can kind of get him back. But there, he has got this kind of... He's almost come from like not trusting anybody to now he will go and he's <laughs> well, prostrate right. himself to everybody with a ball because okay. he comes the routine. How would you tackle that? Um, I'd, 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 I'd pat myself on the back for how far he has come and, 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 and probably five years ago you'd go, what a nice problem that would be to have in five years time. He's too, my, my scared dog is just too friendly. Um, so good for you. Um, I think, I think just, I, I, just, it's not fair to say just, just teach a good recall. Uh, te teach a killer recall. So I would teach a killer recall where you do have a toy and his favourite toy, but it's almost an emergency recall. So teach, teach it like a reflex. So maybe I would go in the garden and not a word it used before. So if you've used come or whatever, you know, I've used the word here. So I'd be in the garden and I'd go here and then I'd pull out the toy and go crazy, regardless of what the dog does. So pair here means you go crazy with a crazy toy. Your dog will join in soon, soon you know, pr pretty quick. Um, and have and, and teach it almost like a reflex. So when you say, it's like me poking you in the back, you don't go, I wonder who that is. I'll turn around and find out. It's gonna be here, the dog can't help but turn back to you. And, and save that for emergencies, and, and maybe you'll use it once every four walks. Not only when he picks up someone else's ball or goes to other people, but just do it once every four walks. So it's nice and random. So literally when you show out here, he drops everything that he's doing and comes to you for the craziness. But maybe build up to that. But also, why is it such a problem? 
Um, and if I've got to go and get somewhere, I, can't, I, I, work at a, I, I do some help at a dog club, and it, you can try, you bet your bottom dollar that. So I'm it's at the end of a walk. Every Sunday morning, when <laughs> the world and his uncle is in the park, you'll yeah, yeah, find yeah. a number of people to come and stay with. I've used the squeaky toy to get him back. Okay. And he will come back for that. Um, and, and you know that is having some success. All right, but, cool. But, but, but obviously, I would, yeah, cool. So I, I would condition something brand new in the garden and build it up to uh, a reflex type uh, recall. Can I just say he's not happy in the garden? We have a neighbour who freaks him out. All right, don't go in the garden. The garden. I can't use the garden. There's one park I can, I can use. He can be off lead where he doesn't freak and bolt. Okay. So, yeah, cool. So introduce it elsewhere where he does feel safe and there's no crazy neighbour. Yeah. <laughs> crazy neighbours, huh? Right. Uh, yeah, a couple more. So we've got a uh, chap at the back there and the lady there. Let's take those two. Could we get another mic? Uh. Hello, I've got um, a Labrador Steffi Cross, who's a rescue dog from Cyprus. Now, he's a lovely dog, but he does like digging holes. <laughs> And I rarely ever catch him in, in the act, and really we don't know what to do about it. Okay. Um. <laughs> so, okay, you can go one or two ways. So you can, you can create a sandpit for him that has the best stuff for him to dig in, and say, yeah, you can do your digging, but you dig over there, so you control it. Or, when he's in the garden, <laughs> two things. When he's in the garden, you be in the garden, so you can interact with him. Or, if he's gonna be in the garden on his own, give him something else to do. So, um, you know, if, 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 even if he, how you feed him is you get the food and you just scatter it out into the garden. So he can sniff and smell and find and move and scavenge. And, and it, maybe it's gonna take him 30 minutes to eat his food rather than three, three seconds in a bowl and then he's twiddling his thumbs. So you can scatter feed, use more interactive feeding toys, uh, and give him, give him something else to do. If, if you've got a dog with a little bit of staffy in there, yeah, food, give him, give him his food, yeah, big deal, thanks very much, lovely. Give him his food that's wrapped up in newspaper and then in a box and another box and another box, so he can rip and dig into it and, and tap into the dissection part of his predatory motor pattern. May well be a lot more um, satisfying and put him on more of an even kill. So, so digging is part of the dog's predatory motor pattern. The predatory motor pattern is seven parts. It's, it's um, the olfactory, so sniffing, then stalking, then chasing, then grab bite, shake kill bite, dissecting, eating. If they can't eat, then they start digging so they can bury food or dig in to find food that they've um, buried before. So if you can tap into somewhere on that predatory motor pattern, that may well alleviate other areas of that dog's predatory motor pattern. So more scavengy, rippy, teary, bitey rubber toy feeding opportunities uh, may well give him something more profitable to do than digging holes. But also, dogs that maybe have lived out in hot climate, they may well dig holes to lay down in to help them cool. You'll find huskies will do that a lot. You, have you found that? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So may, you know, uh, maybe, especially in warm weather, if you've seen it more recently in the warmer weather, make sure there's a shady, cooler area where the dogs hang out and, and let that be the scavenging food ripping cornflake box area. Other boxes are available. So you have a choice, a garden full of holes or a garden full of shredded cardboard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take care uh, Right, I think we have one last question, lady, just on this side over here. What's the strategy for pre-empting something like bonfire night? Uh, bonfire night? Yeah, so what do you do it. so that you don't have a nervous or you've got puppies or okay. you experience the people? So yeah. What would be your way of doing it? Preventative type stuff. Yeah, so Alright, brilliant. Yeah, so good that you're thinking about that now and, and you can stop being constructive about that now. So, um, if you've got a young puppy now, you can, you can start the desensitisation and camera conditioning maybe as well. So desensitisation is exposing the dog to the stimulus, let's say fireworks, at a low enough intensity that you build up that immunity and increase that intensity. So by the time November the 5th comes, 
the dogs, yeah, bring it on, no big deal. I used to, <laughs> back in the day, kids, I used to have to go down to the library and I used to buy the BBC sound effect albums. And then I used to take them and then I would have to play them for the dogs. <laughs> I would put on um, pneumatic drills was always on these uh, albums. Pneumatic drill and feed the dog for the pneumatic. Stop the noise, stop the feed. Firework noise, food, food, food. Stop the fireworks, stop the food. With enough repetition that you put it on and it's firework noises, the dog goes, lovely, bring it on. <laughs> so, you have, so the dog anticipates, the dog has paired something good with that stimulus of that sound. Now, kids, YouTube. You go on firework sounds, YouTube, you've got a million. So with your youngster, put it on you know, volume 0.5 so you can barely hear it, and then just, just have a party with your dog. And next week, volume one, next week, volume two, and just pair it with feeding, relaxation, that kind of thing. If at any point the dog looks a little bit unsettled, just go right the way back down to the beginning. No rush. Do, do it properly once. Um, so yeah, your desensitization process can start now. So not just with fireworks, but with you know, going to the stuff that you know the dog's definitely gonna have to experience. Groomers, going to the vets, all of that stuff. Um, thunderstorms are harder because there's sound, of course there is, but there's also um, atmospheric changes and air pressure changes. We can't simulate that. Um, but you can invest in, invest in all the others and hope that it generalizes into storms. Um, but on top of that, you can look at manipulating the diet, so creating more serotonin in the dog. Um, and that, that, uh, by doing what's called a serotonin diet, you can find stuff on, on the internet about that. And it's about separating protein from the carbohydrates and how you feed it and the timing, and it helps create, it's all to do with tryptophan going across the blood-brain barrier and all that hot stuff. But really, feed your meat separate from your sweet potato. Um, and it, You've, you've got that diffusers, draw your curtains, blast your TV, all of that stuff. So, but if, if you do have a dog that unfortunately is afraid of those kind of things, throw everything at the dog for those um, five or six days, five or six weeks, that really. But, but also that you're, you're, you're uh, doing preventative stuff. Everything from Guy Fawkes to sweet potato in that answer. And, yeah. got that. Uh, and make sure you keep up with your firework festivals, I guess. Otherwise, Diwali will come around and the dog will be like, why am I so hungry? Exactly. Yeah, it's just, uh, okay. Well, look, um, so thank you so much, Steve. As you can see from the screen behind us, uh, Steve has a book out. Steve, uh, shortly after uh, we finish, will be over at the Green and White Stripey Tent, which is W.A. Smith. So if you'd like to go and ask him any questions that have suddenly occurred, he'll be there. His book's on sale, and I'm sure to assign copies for you. Uh, so thank you very much to Steve uh, for his time. Thank you for Paul Achieve for putting on this great space. Uh, one other thing, in fact, this gentleman has it on his lap, which is fantastic. You might see on your seats we have these um, sort of photo cards. Every year we have a photography competition called Capturing the Moment. We've whittled down loads of brilliant entries to a final 24. We need your help to choose a winner. So if you can vote, that would be marvellous. You can see the photos printed out next door or over on near Henderson Hill, we've got big ones up. And for everyone that enters, that we entered into a prize draw, they call it votes, I should say, and this year you can win, just by voting, you can win an incredible trip to Ecuador, seven day cruise around the Galapagos for two people, meals, flights, accommodation, wonderful prize, I'm definitely entering that. And uh, that's all uh, provided kindly by Pura Aventura, I don't know if you've heard of them, they're a wonderful travel company, they're also on Henson Hill, so go and check them out. So please do vote, somebody that comes to our life has to win it, and if it's not me, then I hope at least one of my audience members can, so uh, yeah, good luck with that. But thank you Steve, brilliant tips, great advice, appreciate it.